So welcome everybody. This is another webinar for the Instructional Design and Learning SIG. And today we are lucky enough to have Debbie Kerr as our speaker. Um, we first heard about Debbie at the STC Summit in Washington, D.C. in May, and her topic, uh, Learning Styles and the Cancer Experience, just sounded so much of a good fit for our instructional design and learning SIG that right after the summit, I reached out to her, would she mind doing this as a webinar? And she said yes. So after the webinar is over, I encourage you to go to Debbie's website, uh, laughterandcancer.org or .com? Dot com. Dot com. Laughterandcancer.com. Um, Debbie's got a lot of really great content, both uh, professional and personal. And what I love about it is that it's full of candor. Um, it's full of, uh, it's it's very real, and it's ver she's very generous to share all this with us. So we're so excited. Um, without further ado, Debbie, we would love to hear what you have to say to us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm hoping I meet expectations. I'm, I'm hopeful. I uh, you'll find out as you go th as we go through this uh, journey ourselves that um, I don't know that I'm any kind of typical technical communicator uh, with my slightly uh, demented sense of humor, and I do really <laughs> think outside the box. I've, uh, as it says, the uh, slide says I've been a technical communicator for over 25 years. So I started as a technical writer, but currently I'm a business analyst. Uh, last year, I pub uh, well, not last year anymore, 2016, I published a nonfiction book about the cancer experience, and I, re I write a weekly blog that um, covers everything from cancer to everyday life to epilepsy, because I've been blessed with that as well. Um, so it's got a whole gamut of things. Uh, as, a breast, uh, as far as my breast cancer goes, I've been a patient, technically a survivor, and I'm an advocate. Uh, diagnosed with head symptoms in 2010, wasn't diagnosed till 2011, and I refer to it as the party pack of treatments, surgery, chemo, and radiation. And I'm in <laughs> Ontario, Ontario, Canada, and um, I'm a patient and family advisor for them. So when they different projects come up, you can sign up to take part in them so that you can make the cancer experience better for someone else. So our objectives today are to learn about what is health literacy and what's being done to, to improve it and what still needs to be done. I want to talk about learning styles and how that and the factors that affect them. And I'm also going to talk about some ways that we might be able to um, work with those learning styles to make things a little clearer for everyone and to improve that health literacy. So the definition uh, from the World Health Organization is that health literacy is the cognitive and social skills which determine the motivation and ability of individuals to gain access to, understand, and use information in ways which promote and maintain good health, and that it's not just about reading information. Wow, that was that's I, it's hard to even understand that to some extent. So. When I, in my research, I discovered that apparently the health literacy is slightly better in Canada, but I think that the 10% that um, they're saying have health literacy, so 90% of people in the States do not have enough health literacy to be able to make informed decisions about their care and to follow instructions. Canada fares better, but ours was split out from the seniors separate from the other side. So I've got a feeling to some extent that the um, numbers in the states might have been higher had the seniors been broken out to some extent. Um, if my mother is any example, um, what she doesn't know, she learns from all the other seniors she's around. So she doesn't have a whole lot of accurate information. So the impacts to health literacy, I was actually um, thinking more about what people are told, and I wasn't thinking about some of these other factors. So the factor about, you know, how do you navigate your own healthcare system and filling out complex forms. I think all of us struggle with complex forms, even if we have um, good literacy, uh, literacy skills. So for people that don't, it was even more difficult. And then how do you give your health history? How do you tell somebody what's wrong if you don't know how to communicate that? And then how do, do you get a good diagnosis quickly if 
you can't give the details that you need and you don't know what the details are that you should be sharing. And then for those people that uh, have chronic diseases and, and have to take medication, um, you know how often that uh, people either forget to take their meds, don't quite understand how they're supposed to do it. So they all have impacts that way as to whether you can manage your um, disease and, and, and uh, function to some extent. The other thing that was surprising to me was I didn't even think about the mathematical concept, concepts where you say, oh, there you, this will improve your probability. You have a percentage of this. If you, so I didn't even think of that aspect as being a, a literacy issue because of the mathematical concept. I was thinking more of, of words. So I happened to find this particular um, survey on the internet that somebody had put together because they wanted to make a case to their insurance company as to why um, certain procedures should be covered sooner, like at a younger age. So initially it had this 40 to 50, 50 and over, 30 to 40, and 50 to 65. So I, of course, said in my comments on the site, said, uh, what's the difference between 50 and over and 50 to 65? And so somebody saw the comment and then just, I said, did you mean 65 and over? So somebody added the 65 and over and didn't take down the 50 and over. So then we have like a duplication of things. And so this, and then the fact that people started adding each of their ages, just ignoring the ranges um, in an effort to fill out this online um, survey. And it was actually, had there was a comment section. It was actually on Facebook and people were adding their numbers in there. So you didn't get a sense as to whether the ages they were putting in their comments section were reflected in what they had selected up here. So uh, to many of us, we would find this, you know, easy to follow. And um, uh, apparently we would be part of the 10% the, the that would, you know, understand this as it relates to health. Sorry, folks. Okay, so possible solutions. So when they found out, when the uh, two countries found out how low the health literacy was, they decided the, to, that, that they'd have to use plain language and write at a lower grade level. What I'm suggesting is while this is a great start, um, there's additional changes like even using graphics and images and less text to try and, um, to try and help with that literacy and to provide a wider array of methods of getting that information out there, just still forcing people to read, whether it be pamphlets or booklets or whatever, still doesn't get you where you need to go when there's other ways that uh, people learn. And uh, it's just reading. Reading isn't everything. It's important, but it's not everything. So as the title of my uh, presentation implies, there's some learning styles discussed. I said that there's a basic definition of preferred way of learning. And when I started doing my research, I felt that yes, there would be one that would just work well for here and only to discover that uh, somebody did a study and found 71 different learning styles. And I sure as heck wasn't gonna read about each one and try and figure out which one worked. And in fact, it was ironic when I did a search on learning styles on Wikipedia just for the heck of it. I discovered that there was a bigger section that talked about how all the other information that was there was wrong or not validated enough than the actual content about the learning styles. So in the same study, uh, what uh, Cofield did was group the learning styles into basically five categories. One was constitutionally based, which was basically saying that it was the hardest one to change. It's the one you're born with. Um, it's a dom dominance of a particular sensory or, or perceptual channels. Uh, this includes facts. So what you may have heard is whether you're visual, auditory, kinesthetic, or in this T stands for tactile person. I think that's probably one of the most common that people have heard of. And that's sort of the category it would fall into. The cognitive structure has to do with how you, what your thought processes are, processes are, how you think through things. Uh, the ones highlighted in black were the ones that actually this person studied in more detail to try and see if um, things were repeatable. If you use this particular learning style, there was like four criteria. Uh, only one hit all four, and that was the one under flexibility, flexibly stable learning preferences. 
So back to the cognitive structure again, that was the way of thinking. The stable personality type, you might find it odd to see Myers-Briggs there as a learning style. But I guess if you look at your personality type, if, you, if you're one of those people that just sort of um, is more introverted, you may not ask the same questions as you would before. You may not be willing to go out there and try things. You may be more timid, but you still get the information that you need. You still learn just in a different way. Probably my biggest preference is the flexibly stable learning preferences. Um, basically, it says that when you have one sort of basic um, learning style, but depending on situation and content and everything, that learning preference may, may change. And the last category is the one that seems to be sort of um, getting more, more and more of as time goes on. It's just learning approaches and strategies to it. They're not really styles, but they're um, approaches to dealing with different learning styles. So with that huge selection, I decided to go with the one that most of us are probably have heard of, which is VAC or VARC. Um, the person that invented VAC or came up with VAC, the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, um, at one point someone decided that read-write should be added as another component to this. So basically visual was split out. So visual was just became totally just graphics oriented and rewrite um, became um, a, a, a spin off of the visual one so that it's got some, some more text in it. So I'm gonna go through here, talk about each of these different learning styles and give examples that go with that. Some of them cancer specific so that you can get a better sense of maybe what we could do to help with the health literacy. So one of the things we need to do is know our audience. It's not like um, where if you're documenting how to use a computer or, or a printer or something where you've got, well, not with the, where you've got a sort of audience that you understand and know. If someone is out there with, and you're talking about one of these great big printers, it's more likely that, um, you know, they work in a certain environment um, at work. So they probably have a certain age, um, certain level of education. But with cancer, you wouldn't, you basically you cover all the whole gambit. And you also have this emotional element that's part of that as well. Uh, and existing knowledge, unless you have a recurrence of your cancer, you don't have some existing knowledge to base, to base things on. So it's uh, quite a, a different mix with the cancer experience. You also, when you're looking at how you learn, you know yourself that your uh, the circumstances will determine whether how you how you deal with the situation. So in some cases, if you're flying solo, you might do something one way. If you've got time constraints, you do it slightly differently. Um, the repercussions of what you're doing will often so like you wouldn't necessarily use trial and error if you're um, if um, so you're doing something that would impact someone's life. You would uh, do it more methodically. You also know that sometimes your learning style differs from what you do at home versus what you do at work. And sometimes you just try it because you've read the instructions, your level of frustration is up there. So when you're typically maybe a read-write person, you become a kinesthetic learner because you just got to get in there and try it. You don't want to read anything anymore. Again, two certain learning styles just aren't conducive uh, to so, like for the subject matter. So, I mean, for sports, I mean, you could watch all the videos you want, but out, until you get out there and actually do it, you don't, you don't learn. The arts would be sort of a sad if somebody just described it to you and you can't actually see the pictures. So, again, there's just a lot of variables that impact how you would learn. So, we'll start with the visual learners first. So, based on various things I found on the web, 40% of all nerves nerve fibers connected to the brain are linked to the retina. Wow. Our eyes can register 36,000 visual messages per hour. No wonder we're tired. 90% uh, of information that comes to the brain is visual and approximately 65% of the population are visual learners. Now, when we're reading this, 65% are visual learners. I, I'm assuming that that would also include anybody that had a rewrite preference. So because it was at one point grouped all in with visual. But certainly looking at these numbers really, really demonstrates just how strong we are oriented towards visuals and 
and, and which makes it even worse that most vi times visuals aren't there. And uh, so our chances of improving health literacy really go down. So here is a traditional graph. There was a study done with um, graphs that were put together that had these really wild and crazy pictures around them. And the thought was before the study was that it would be distracting to have those pictures. And what they found was that ultimately the graphics associated with that one, like even like a stack of uh, glasses to show how many drinks a, a person typically has over the course of a, of a um, five hours or whatever it happens to be, that would be make it more memorable. So what they found was that people didn't necessarily, whether they had graphs like this versus pictures, didn't remember things any differently. But if you went back and asked those people about those graphs three weeks later, the difference was huge as to which ones were more memorable and people could talk about, recognize what topic they were about, um, you know, what, what was higher, what was lower. So your traditional graph here is, plus you, you had thrown a graphic there, so at least now you have an arrow as opposed to the other one. Then this one would, you would remember that this had to do with money. If you were, or so you would know that it was a sales topic just by changing your graphic to some kind of picture that demonstrates money. I found this one, which I assume is about rating or a grade. Uh, the fact that they all get worse, so that D would be your highest is unfortunate. I think this made it look pretty, but it would be a great way to talk about um, maybe cities and what their, their grade is for uh, financial respons fiscal responsibility. And so you've got your green indicating the best one and down to your red, which is the worst one. But again, this would stick with you because you've got your color plus you've got your, your text here and um, it would make it memorable. So for this one, I thought, okay, this could conceivably be about vehicle repairs or maybe car accidents because we've got a road, we've got arrows, we got one that's in the middle that's red, so, and that's the highest, and that sort of implies to me it's a negative, as opposed to say car car sales, where you'd want, you know, maybe the highest one to be green. But either way, you know that this road ties into it, this visual clues you into that it has something to do with vehicles. So when we come to health, the problem is that there's abstract information. It's not like if someone talks about a cell, that you have necessarily ever seen a cell except prison, but we're not going there. But in this case, where we're talking about health literacy, you've got abstract information you have to get across. You've got terms and concepts. There's nothing that, you know, tangible to hang on to. There's no consistent procedures. I mean, even if you have cancer, the steps taken to diagnose it and treat it are not always the same. There's so many variables with that. And it's not like if the first treatment that you know right after that, you know what, I don't have to do any more treatments. There's no, it's not like there's an immediate cause and effect if, like it would be if you press this button on the computer, you see the results right away. And in the case of health information, you're being the recipient, not the one that's actually giving the information. So this happens to be my book. But I used an analogy to try and get the concept of the, or the whole concept of a cancer journey um, to, to try to make it clear as to what's going through. So basically, this is not my whole table of contents, but it, I, I go from, you know, your baggage, the baggage associated with your trip is what basically your most emotional health, what um, personality traits you should take with you. So for those of us that are analytical, your what if scenarios, that's not a good thing to pack and bring with you because when you're going through diagnosis and treatment, you're always thinking, well, what, what if it's this? What if it's that? So it's something that you don't want to pack. Um, cancer patients will talk about how terrible the wait times are. And it's almost like waiting for your trip where you're just hoping to that, for that magical day when you're actually going to depart. Well, in this case, the wait are the tests and results. Diagnosis is actually that day when you take off because you sort of, you're now moving forward and that's what you want. So treatments are different for each person. So it's like a flight where you've got multiple stops and layovers. It's not always the same for everybody that goes on that flight. You might take go to a different location, a different order. 
But uh, either way, there's usually some kind of stops or layovers. The t the, when there is no stop, I basically would mean that you had no cancer diagnosis. And then there's a result of the landing and the jet lag associated with that. So that's basically the end of the treatments and possible depression that can follow. And then the ongoing maintenance of the plane is basically your new normal. So by explaining it this way, it's hopeful that people have something to latch onto that's, that may be familiar to them. Most people will have flown at some time or other. So this is what I, this is what I, why I did that. So to help with the visual component, we intuitively compare things to things that other people would be familiar with. So we talk about hail being the size of a golf ball. So people can get a visual of a golf ball and they go, oh, okay, you got a sense of it, so how big it was. With tumors, I mean, this may tell you have a one centimeter tumor, you have a three centimeter one. One, um, it's metric. So it's not like if you don't deal with metric, I mean, I, I sort of deal with both in Canada, but if you're not used to the metric system and people start throwing centimeters at you, then it's like you have no clue. And really that size is just hard to visualize. So if a golf ball is four centimeters, then you got a concept of, okay, mine is, you know, bigger than a golf ball or smaller than a golf ball. So at least you have some point of reference. Now, lymph nodes, what are they and why do I care? Because that's one of those terms that will come up during the whole cancer experience is lymph nodes. What's a lymph node? So initially, they're just words. So, you know, if you Google lymph nodes, it sort of looks like there's green things all over your body with these little nodules, which you assume are the nodes. So then the doctor talked about sentinel nodes. So, and, and something else, some other kind of note that started with an A, but because I knew what a sentinel was, in my mind, this is how I thought of those sentinel notes. I thought of soldiers that are standing guard, that they are the first, sort of first line of defense that something bad would have to get by before um, it could attack the rest of your body. So a check is done to see where the tumor is draining in the first place the tumor drains is to the sentinel notes. If it's not in the sentinel nodes, the cancer, it's not found there, then they don't even have to worry about the other nodes because it has to hit this first. So in my mind, this other word that sounded to me like auxiliary, because sentinel, then you'd have obviously have the auxiliary that are the backups. So if the cancer got past the sentinel nodes, then the auxiliary would be the backup and they would be the ones then that you test um, during surgery or whatever to make sure the cancer hasn't spread to that those nodes. Now you'll notice looking at the spelling that it does not say auxiliary, it says axillary. So what I found out was under your arm is called the axilla and so the nodes there are the axillary nodes. But when you don't know something, you try to make sense of it based on what you already know. And just as a humorous story, as an aside to that one, my mother was talking to me about a procedure that somebody at, at um, she lived in a condominium with a bunch of other seniors saying, um, you know, someone has a problem down under and they have to have a horoscope. So for her, she didn't know what the word was. So she applied it to the word horoscope because she knew it. And so accidentally was an accurate description of the horror that you have when you have to have a scope. So this campaign is the Know Your Lemons campaign. This was started in the UK and over the course of last year had 166 million views of this campaign or, or these graphics. So what they did, this, this, the bonus to this one is it so, went on social media and because there are no nipples, it can go freely anywhere. It's not going to be blocked. It's not going to be taken off. Uh, they said that the women found it less intimidating than actually looking at pictures of breasts. Uh, so, and then this, each one sort of, if you're, if provides a visual of the thing that's wrong. So with the growing vein, you can see the vein on the side of the, of, of the lemon, you can see bumps, you can see the redness and the heat. This was my symptom, actually uh, fluid coming out of my nipple. 
but you can see that it's uh the fact that it just took off in like i think three weeks it hit seven point something million and then over the course of the year progressed to 166 million and it was actually rated as one of the top 10 social media campaigns last year so on to our auditory learning um, and so there's actually a quote from Plato saying, I would teach children music, physics and philosophy, but most importantly music for the pattern of music and all the arts are the keys to learning. So this, is, this takes us to the first link that I want you to select. I'll give you some background. I don't know the ages of you that are listening, but um, if you're my age, um, and you may have watched Happy Days in the 1970s, which takes place in the 1950s and 60s. And uh, one character, the Fonz, is the cool guy. And uh, somehow he makes everything work. One of the characters is named Potsy. Potsy loves music. Potsy's about to fail one of his courses at school. And so the Fonz, recognizing even then that Potsy has an auditory learning style, comes up with a song that the whole class sings to, and you will see if Potsy's doing the, um, doing his test, he's tapping his foot and he's sort of singing to himself to be able to complete the, the test. And when he ultimately gets a perfect exam, the teacher says, you, you must have cheated. There's no way you got this. And so the whole class decides to demonstrate what song Potsy was singing in his head to be able to to, to do his exam. So if you want to click on this link, then we can you can listen to it and then we'll start the presentation again. Sorry again that you can't hear the sound through this thing, but um, you can just start it. All right, and the link is in the chat window. Um, so we'll be back in a minute and 43 seconds. Let me know when you're ready and you've seen it, watched it through. So is everybody back? Yep, back. That was great. So uh, it's a, obviously an old video and, um, and it's, you know, certainly not real life experience, at least not the classes I've been in. But that really hit home with a lot of people. When they saw that, they started writing and asking for the lyrics they wanted to, kids wanted to learn doing that, teachers wanted to use it as a learning tool. So even when I went on YouTube to look for this, I found examples of teachers even within the last five years still using this as an assignment for their class to learn the circulatory system. 
And there were comments from people who have just recently discovered it while they were looking for information on the internet, who came across it and were excited to see it and said that they would they would be using this to help them learn for their exams. So a um, little unorthodox, but you know what? Sometimes you, either between being an auditory learner, hearing it this way in a catchy way, it sticks with you. I found even getting ready for this um, presentation, the number of times that I listened to that song and it got stuck in my head. So I apologize ahead of time. There's, there's going to be another one that's similar to this, so you'll get to hear it again. So it next we go. To, it reminds me of Schoolhouse Rock too when we were kids, which I found very useful. Good, good to hear. That's right, Terry. I still remember my schoolhouse rock. You know, I'm just a bill. I'm just a bill. <laughs> yeah. That's what, 40 years <laughs> later, I think? So, so the next uh, I thought, this is the new one, the one that was previously just visual, where you have the read, write learners as well. Um, so for cancer one of the things that everybody hears about is what stage is the person that's diagnosed with cancer so for breast cancer there's stages zero to four and there's actually an a and b for stages two and three um i did not even know that there was such a thing as a stage zero to me that would imply that there was no cancer but actually what stage zero is is that the um cancer is within the ducts within the breast and it has not spread anywhere so to come up with these stages, there's various things that um, they look at. So they may talk about, okay, the size of the tumor, whether it's in or outside of the ducts, whether um, it's spread to other parts of the body, and um, the, if there's any lymph nodes involved. So now you know what a lymph node is, so you can <laughs> at least get that part. So I am going to show you sort of what I came up with to help remember, because I can never remember what the criteria is for a stage, but I wanted to use this... Uh, learning technique to uh, see if maybe it will be me become memorable to you. So I figured to get to a stage, you have to take stairs. And I put the, the um, material for how you, how you know what a stage is in an order of list so that you've got a word to tie to it. So looking at the list, check to see if there's node involvement, whether it's invasive or non-invasive, if it's spread to other parts of the body, and the tumor size, so L-A-S-T. Then, in addition to the stage, when you're looking at your pathology report, we talk about hormone receptors. So they may say that you're estrogen negative or positive, progesterone negative or positive, or HER2 negative or positive. Now, my question is, what the heck is a hormone receptor? So while you look at this comparison, um, don't laugh at the one on the left. That is basically the one that my doctor drew for me, and it was my most prized possession. So when somebody's telling you verbally what these different stages and stuff are and what all this information is, it just doesn't register because, again, you have to remember it's, um, it's abstract. There's nothing to hang on. There's no, no visual to reinforce to you what's going on. So when a doctor draws a picture, I remember this of all the information I got over the time of my diagnosis treatment, this is the graphic that I remember. And I talked to another friend of mine that has also gone through the, the cancer experience, and she, she said the same thing. She says, nobody else in my family, if I show it to them, has a clue what it means, but it means so much to me. And she says, I have saved all of the pictures that have been drawn for me. So I took the picture that my doctor drew for me and turned it into the graphic on the right. So again, we've got at least you can see what a cell is. You can see the, the cups. It's just a, a more streamlined approach. Now, if you have hormone, re hormone receptors that are positive, or, um, that means that you have those hormone receptors where the cancer-causing estrogen can attach to these receptors. Now, it's a, while it may be a bad thing to have hormone receptors, what it means is to be positive is not bad in this, is, is not, um, bad in the sense. What it means is, you see this, this little line here? This means that there's a pill that you can take that will block those receptors so that the cancer-causing estrogen cannot reattach itself. So this is, this is what this, this whole graphic means, was about the medication that you could potentially take to, keep, to try and prevent a recurrence. Now remember I said 
that you tie things to something that would be familiar to people. So I, I attached it to a bath mat and the suction cups on the bottom because everybody would know what a bath mat is. People would know what a suction cup is. So basically on the left talks about the estrogen receptor. So they're the suction cup and the bad estrogen just sticking in there and triggering the cancer. Now on the diagram on the right, we have estrogen receptors on drugs. So basically tamoxifen, as you will see down here is the name of the medication that you might be taking or one of the medications that you might take to stop the bad estrogen from, from attaching to these suction cups. So basically it's like putting a piece of paper over the top of the suction cup and instead of the bad estrogen attaching to that suction cup, it just basically falls down. So one of the things that I, if you're doing documentation like this, I'd encourage you to do is possibly use inanimate objects to associate and explain things because those inanimate objects are something that are familiar to people. So just like you talked about the hail and the comparison point, comparing things to something that's familiar to people is also, is also helpful. So now we get on to the kinesthetic learners, which is sort of what you guys became when you clicked on the links to get to things, so that you learn by doing. Um, more males than females are supposed to be kinesthetic learners. And um, these are the people that are more interactive with, with software. And nowadays, I mean, kinesthetic learners are, are, would love um, all of the different audiovisual things that you can do, the, the modules of uh, courses and stuff that you complete online. And actually what's great about those is that, um, you know, it's basically hitting a whole lot of learning styles. So you've got your visual, you've got your text, you've got the option to turn your sound on or off. So if auditory doesn't work for you, you can just turn off the sound because sometimes you're listening to the, the sounds and um, it's driving you crazy because you're reading at a different speed than the person's uh, reading it out. So this is time for your second video. This is a follow, this is the same Happy Days Pumps Your Blood song, but one of the students from one of the teacher's classes came up with a variation of this because um, with the first video, some people might have thought that it was a little fast. You might have thought it was a little hard to hear the words because someone was singing them. So someone has come up with this video to not, in this case, they didn't slow it down, but there is, there are, is an example um, on the internet of somebody that has slowed it down and actually put it into more of a country and Western tune to, to be able to let people hear and understand what's going on. This one, uh, the person has added words. So have you sent out the link? link? Yeah, I sent out the link and we'll all go and we'll come back in a minute, 23 seconds, okay? Oh, shoot. So I'm back. Oh. How about everybody else? Yep. Yeah. That was so, so you, much better. I I were uh, just seeing the different body parts and seeing the words that really brought it home a lot better than watching Richie run around and clap. 
So yeah, that's that's how I felt. I mean, I liked the first one. It was upbeat. Now, so the thing is with this one, obviously, um, someone had to put that together. So it's you've got your um, your kinesthetic learners who like to learn by doing. So what um, is great about that? So when teachers give this assignment, they have the song, but the kids have to come up with the script to go with it. They have to come up with the visuals to go with it. And then they have to do the editing and putting it all together. So in doing that, they're reinforcing with each, each stage that they complete to, to learn the actual subject matter. So that's why I put it in the kinesthetic section as opposed to say the, the read write or the, the auditory because it was pulling it all together, including not only interacting with that, with that visual, but actually creating it. So yes, I like that one better too. This other example is um, a link. We have um, an actual someone that presented at one of the summit conferences uh, was uh, Corinne Rangret, and she actually is an academic researcher. And she talked about um, software that was developed so that people that were going to do have gastric bypass surgery could go in and watch modules as many times as they wanted to learn about the procedure that was going to be done. They were interviewed before the um, before they had actually looked at the, these um, modules and um, had them explain what was actually going to happen based on their understanding from what they heard the doctor explain. And then they interviewed those same people afterwards. And um, the, the, it was just amazing how much clearer people could describe what was going to happen, how they understood it so much better after they had had a chance to interact with this video. So while I couldn't get an example of the video that um, this company put together, um, Corinne gave me a link to this one. And uh, what I find useful in this um, is that they use terminology. They show the proper term as well as what you might call it. So instead of saying, you know, um, so you'll, you'll see going through this. So you see meniscus or cartilage, it will give you some examples of of real world, real world term, everyday language, and, and what the actual terminology is for that. So if you can one last time go and uh, go on the internet and watch this one, you have to sort of, the link will take you to the top of the page and you just have to scroll to the bottom and you'll see this picture and that's the one that you will start. And we'll be back in a minute and 33 seconds. So that was pretty clear. I liked the way that they took the body parts apart so you could see sort of how and why and really understand the whole process. Is so everybody yeah, so back?
So Debbie, are we back? I'm 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 here. I don't know if everybody else is back. Jeez, did we lose everybody? No, they're just being quiet. They're waiting on us. Okay. So to continue, I'm actually going to do a review just to see with this uh, learning. So Allison says she's back. Thank you, Allison. Oh, yeah. Good deal. Thanks for the feedback. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go through a review to see if based on all these different learning styles, actually what you can remember from the presentation. So I don't know if we want to open up the mics for this one or just have people type something in the chat to answer these questions. So maybe we'll just go with the chat. What did I say the graph with the roads on it applied to? And it was way at the beginning of the presentation, so hopefully it was. Go ahead. Allison says traffic in the chat. Anybody else? So I'm going to type into the chat just for fun. I say car sales and accidents. Well, if I said because the graph had the red arrow in the middle, I had thought it was car sales, but then I thought because it was red, I said car repairs or accidents. Mm -hmm. So there you go. We got the accidents part, but at least you, we, everybody knew because it was a road that it was tied to a vehicle of some kind. So what is the first node into which a tumor drains? What's the name of the lymph node? Fentanyl. Beautiful. Yes. Sorry. I'm sorry, I had to drop off for a minute. I'm back. I'm Okay, so what was the second type of node? This was a little more difficult for me. We'll see if you guys can remember. Oh, Allison got it. Axillary. X and Allison. <laughs> I'm so proud <laughs> of both of us. <laughs> Not auxiliary. That's right. But at least that helps you remember. And it's still like, I mean, while it's not the actual name, it tells you what they're for. Right. So, and what are hormone receptors like? Give me the real day example of what hormone receptors are like. So, uh, just a sec, Deb. So, Allison says that she remembered because, uh, I quote, I think I made the same mistake you first did with the auxiliary. So, nice. It's nice to have company, <laughs> <laughs> even if it's an ignorance. Serendipitous, I think. Okay, we'll go with that. Sounds much more pleasant. So what are the hormone receptors like? So I showed the doctor's oh, drawing. Terry and Al Allison says bath mats and Terry says suction cups. Absolutely, perfect. So what's the list of considerations when determining the stage? Remember we use the word list. So if you just want to do one, let's do with the, the L. Does anybody remember what the L stood for? So Terry says lymph invasive. So L was lymph node involvement. I is invasive or non-invasive. So she's okay. covered off two letters. Beautiful. Uh, the S. <laughs> Terry okay, says, S I'm trying to remember S, but T was tumor. She's getting ahead of us. S is size, oh, I guess? So, well, so. S was whether or not it had spread. Oh, spread. Okay. And Allison said, darn, my phone rang at that point. <laughs> Poor Allison. <laughs> She's doing well for someone with a ringing phone. I'm telling you. She's multitasking. And Terry so, says, yes. all right. So, yeah. So, a list was lymph node involvement. I was whether it's invasive or non-invasive. S was whether it's spread. And T is whether that was the tumor size. So, you guys did pretty well. And the last question was, how many symptoms of cancer are there based on the Know Your Lemons campaign? So I didn't actually mention the number, but if you look at the visual, it should tell you how many. Terry says 12. How many? There's yes. a dozen eggs in that 
lemon yep. carton there. Yep. So, I mean, I, apparently there's even more, but at least people with that campaign know that there's more than just a lump that's a sign of potential breast cancer. And since I didn't have that lump, this was really important to me to know that there were all these other ones. I didn't even know that it was a sign of cancer, so I didn't, I didn't panic like I maybe should have. <laughs> I held my panic in check. Sometimes ignorance is bliss. So in conclusion, this is my definition of what a learning style is a preferred but fluid method of learning that is influenced by factors such as audience, situation, personality, subject matter, and type of information. Achieving a greater health literacy is not relying on just words and providing a variety of ways for learning is the best approach because then you can sort of pick and choose what works for you. And learning can be fun and continue to be memorable for many years to come. Just think of pumping your blood. Deb, I want to inter question? interrupt for just a sec because um, Terry has a really good comment in the chat. Um, going back to the lemon, the lemon graphic, um, yep. Terry says, I thought it was a brilliant example and that actual pictures would have been distracting by being specific. So. Perfect, yes. And Allison. Let's see, Allison says, I agree, great examples to illustrate these different styles. Beautiful. The other thing with the Know Your Lemon campaign is if you go to their website, and like if you go to the knowyourlemons.org, it actually takes you to the, um, um, what is it? There's, it actually redirects you to somewhere else. But if you go to that website, it is actually a whole, it's like, works like an infographic. So when you go to the first page, you just keep scrolling down and there's more pictures and more pictures of, or graphics of things to explain it, whether it be um, going for your hospital, going to see your doctor, and then the steps that gets taken to to do a diagnosis. It's it's really awesome. It also talks about um, it shows the inside like an, a lemon cut in half, and it describes then that the seeds in the lemons are what you're feeling for because they tell you to do breast self examination, but knowing what you're actually feeling for is never really fully explained. So they talk about the the um, the, the seeds inside being what you're actually feeling for. So I thought that was real, just really awesome. And what's actually happening there is they're now putting together um, packages that can go out across the world because they're translating it to all these different languages uh, to explain breast cancer and all the all things tied to it. Any questions? I thought this was really good. I haven't really thought about, <clears throat> um, I mean, I know about different learning styles, but seeing different examples in real life examples of how you would address the same information in different venues is really useful. Good. Thanks for that feedback, Terry. Yeah, I think because of the subject is one, Debbie, you pointed out there's a lot of emotion wrapped around this uh, for the audience and probably also for the providers um, that this, this was a topic that gripped me in a way that maybe like doing the same kinds of material for about software design might not have. Um, I probably would not have signed up. <laughs> <laughs> So I think no, also it, it was intriguing to think, now, wait a minute, you're going to deal with this from with, with a humorous point of view, but not in a non-serious point of view, that that was interesting to me, too. So, yes, yeah, so there's actually, I have a blog post that goes, I must have done cancer wrong. <laughs> and because people talk about, oh, they expect you to feel, um, people sort of apply the emotions to the person that has cancer based on what they think they would feel. Yeah. And so there's certain expectations as to how a cancer patient should, should react. And I have to admit that I did um, really make this one intern. Um, he didn't know what to do with me. Um, so he was asking me questions. And, and it's funny how dates and, and results all just sort of stick with you forever. So he's going through my chart. I've gone back to see my surgeon. And... Um, he was, he, like I said, he was an intern. So he's going, and you had your surgery on, and I tell him the exact 
And he says, and your results were, and I tell him what they were. So he finally closed the file. And he said, he said to me, he says, well, um, what treatments did you have? And that's where I use the phrase. I had the party pack of treatments. I had surgery. <laughs> I had chemo. I had radiation. And then he said, you know, may I examine you to, to look at your scar sort of thing? Because I had a mastectomy, mastectomy. So he checks it and he goes, this is beautiful work. And I said, I have gotten so many compliments on it. I should have had it done years ago. And just the look on his face, he's just such a young guy. I said, I bet you he went home and said, Mommy, I don't know how to deal with these people who are not behaving the way I expect them to. So that was what my blog post was, where, um, you know, I used humor. I didn't necessarily react the way others might have expected me to, to react. And there are a lot of women out there that apparently did cancer wrong the same way I did. Because, yeah, there was just that, that particular blog post got a, a whole lot of hits. Um, because, yeah, there's an expectation. And I've presented this um, other places. And sometimes when I do that, people... I've had people say, oh, it was like a soapbox. It was, you know, it was like a support group. And I'm thinking, how could this be seen as a support group? I, know, I wasn't sure where that comment came from. But I think, too, it's a case of, to some extent, thinking that this is how people behave. This is how cancer patients would react to it. So this whole thing is just, just providing support. And so, yes, it's funny how our preconceived ideas as to how, how things should happen really does, sometimes interferes with the learning experience. And, I, and it, to me, it's, um, it's an interesting idea to think about how you make something memorable, and it can be in different ways that you make <coughs> things memorable. Yeah, and so, like I said, with that one diagram, people laugh at it, but it was like, that's the thing I remembered most because when people are just talking to me and you're trying to figure, you've got no baseline for half of what's being said, um, having a visual to be able to take home and even like requesting your pathology reports if you don't get them online to be able to look at them and, and read it and start, try to understand what you're seeing as opposed to just relying on what's heard. And even if you take someone with you to take notes while you're going through the whole diagnosis thing, the other person doesn't have the baseline either. And so they're taking notes of what they remember, and they may remember more than you did. But again, it's almost like, to some extent, the blind leading the blind because they don't have the knowledge either. But you're sort of hoping that between the two, you put together one cohesive picture. Right. So feel free to contact me at any time using any of these social media uh, methods or, or my email. Um, if you go to the Laughter and Cancer website, there's a, a link for blog, which has, like I said, a whole, a whole range of topics covered there. And uh, like I said, I try and do something every two weeks. Um, but yeah, some are, uh, are some real hot items, like when my, my fake boob broke. <laughs> I, uh, um, it, was, it's my it was my prosthetic, actually. Um, the seam of it opened. I'd had it as a best buddy for six years, and I went to pick it off the bed because I just toss it <laughs> wherever and play a game of where's where's the boob um, on my bed. And it's it was sticky when I picked it up, so I realized that the seam was starting to come apart. So I, my blog post was about the memories that I shared with this thing and how I was going to be sad for it to go, to get a new one, and. Uh, it took off. There were 854 hits, unique hits on that blog post in one day. Awesome. Okay. This is really good. Thanks very much. You're welcome. So I think it's time for a big round of applause for Debbie. I'm going to clap close to my microphone so you can hear it. I'm trying to clap by my mic too. <laughs> <laughs> and I know Allison, David, Kathleen, you guys are, are clapping virtually, right? They've got their mics uh, muted. So, <sighs> oh, yeah. And Kathleen says yes with a smiley. Absolutely. Well, that, Allison. Perfect. Al Allison says, thanks so much for sharing your experiences. That is good feedback, too. And we also want to thank you guys for attending. Um, thanks to everybody who signed up 
Thank you. If you're attending um, afterwards, if you're watching the video, we really just appreciate your support. Um, I see David's turn on his mic. David, do you want to say something? I've never seen anything like this before. You've told a story that we can all remember. That's beautiful. I really appreciate that, David. It, it, when you you show those uh, lemons in the egg box, and you showed each this, uh, each form of cancer differently, that kind of like gets frozen in your in your mind, and then that yes, carries so, with you more than just the slides with all the jibber jabber all over it. We are visual thinkers. So yeah, there's a lot of people like you. So this, like the person in the UK that um, did this Know Your Lemons thing, I can't remember if I reached out to her, she reached out to me. And uh, so we've been in contact. She actually asked for a copy of the paper I wrote for the summit that relates to this, this learning style. Cause I told her, I contacted her to tell her that I had used her campaign in my presentation because it made such a difference to me. And it's good to hear it's making the same kind of impression on you guys. Yeah, in a, in a previous time, you know, um, the IDL SIG had given a presentation about uh, these stunning kind of PowerPoint presentations that don't follow the out-of-the-box format. And when you break away and create, use PowerPoint to create stories, that it is much more learnable and understandable than the out-of-the-box bullets and these drawings that really don't make any sense to anyone but in a in, in the corporate world those are stunning uh, it, it is very important that this SIG continue to emphasize that the out-of-the-box format is not an effective means of communicating anything and you've proved it again so great for you Yahoo <laughs> And is your can and are you doing better now with your cancer? Um, it's been now uh, what? Uh, ironically, I think diagnosis day was Valentine's Day, um, so it's been since they, diagnosis apparently is the marker as to when you start count, counting the number of years of cancer free. So I was diagnosed in 2011, so I will be um, what two it'd be seven years in February. So I'm good. Wow. So that deserves applause too. And that, yes. And now you're an advocate. Oh yes, I was an advocate all along. That's a whole other presentation. I uh, <laughs> I um, ran into some problems at the um, medical facility I went to first. They people had asked for certain tests to be done, and the the radiologist at that facility kept turning down the request. So my surgeon that was in the same city where I live actually sent me to another city to continue my cancer um, tests and treatment because um, and the first thing that my surgeon said at the new facility was, so you couldn't get by the radiologist, huh? Oh, and wow. Because, and so because of my... Um, um, because mine was hard to see, she, she, actually when I saw that I had the MRI, that would kept getting declined. Um, my surgeon, the next time I saw her, says, "You just lit up like a Christmas tree." <laughs> and she says, "We didn't, couldn't possibly understand. We couldn't see the full extent as to how much cancer was there until you had the MRI." So, um, and then I actually had it ended up having an MRI biopsy um, as well. So they could. That's when they actually found out that I had. Because at first they thought it was just within the ducts or just slightly outside the ducts. Uh, and then once they did this MRI biopsy, then they found out that I actually had tumors embedded within the cancer that was by the milk, by the milk ducts. So yeah, so these additional tests were just sort of would impacted how the final treatments were. So yeah, so I wrote letters to the facility here each time uh, saying, and my letters were not letters. They, I, I'm a tech writer for Pete's sake, so I had heading this background, areas of concern, uh, recommendations. That's so I wrote 
each letter resulted in either a phone call or um, or one case I actually got a letter back from the radiologist that was addressed to his bosses and I was CC'd in and it was so condescending that I wrote yet another letter which ended up being a 20 page report <laughs> that I sent to the facility and then a meeting was organized with four relatively high level people in that facility and I said how long is this meeting for and they said as long as it, you need it and my actual my doctor my GP was with me and she was there for the first hour because the switch rooms I'm sure they did not anticipate it would take more than an hour and so I had to basically hold her back at points in uh, that meeting because she was so we'll call it animated um, and then in the second half of the meeting she wasn't there so it was just me with these four people from the hospital and we talked for another hour to the point where one of the people um, ironically um, the people from the Ministry of Health actually showed up at the hospital that day for um, some kind of that there was a um, it wasn't like a plan meeting so the one guy in my um, discussion uh, asked me for permission to leave or should he actually um, go and get someone else to meet with them. So it was a very empowering experience. Excellent. Good for you. I figure when you've got the tech writing skills that you can communicate this information, you have to do something for people that can't do it, who have the low health literacy, who are going to just follow and do whatever they're told to do, even if it's not right. And may never even know that that happened to them. No. Uh, she makes a, a great point too is when you get this diagnosis you have cancer and then suddenly it's like your head I, I just only imagine your head is spinning and like now what and where do you get the answer of now what and how do you explain these options when all you want to do is be cancer free and you want the doctor to drive it is that that the same thing that happened with you and is it that because there was more information as you learned that you became educated and because and be ask intelligent questions to these doctors well it's funny how you you hate the waiting when you're going through the whole tests and everything because you can't things don't seem to move fast enough and then once you have a diagnosis, things take off to a speed that you didn't think was possible and you wish things would slow down because you're trying to comprehend everything and what you should be doing. But now that they know for sure it's cancer, it's like move, 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 move. Um, so I said it's like um, studying for an exam where you've got, you know, you're, you're, you've got a period of time to prepare for it ahead of time, although no one ever does. Um, but with this, yes, you're learning all this terminology so quickly at such an accelerated rate that, yeah, you, you have trouble to, to actually think clearly. And I think I actually asked for my uh, chemo to be delayed by a week or so after uh, when it was scheduled. And they were just shocked by that. And I said, I want to think things through for a bit. I figured if I'd already taken so long to be diagnosed one week or two weeks, wasn't going to do me in. So, yeah, I, I, I stopped it for a bit and asked some questions. and, and um, you know, sometimes you just have to, you can't just go in, but you mean there's an element of trust. People um, belong to a couple different Facebook groups that are for um, breast cancer patients. And so it's sort of neat to learn from other people as well. There's, but I didn't go on the internet when I had was diagnosed with cancer because it became a scary place. That's a whole other talk that I've given where, um, you know, our go-to thing for uh, our resources, the internet. And because, there's nothing to contain where you go. I refer to it as eating just one chip. No one can do it. Go to what, just one page and stay there. What you end up doing is clicking on all these links until finally you're seeing stuff that you had, you did not want to see. You thought you did, but you really did not want to see it. Whether it be pictures or, you know, your chances of survival or all that kind of stuff. It's not, so I just stopped using the internet. So all these resources that were available to me, like Facebook groups or specific site, I just didn't see until after the fact because I was too afraid to use the internet. So that's another thing to consider is your delivery method for some of this stuff. I use booklets because the booklets were self-contained. Here's ones on radiation. Here's one on chemo. It's not like it was so exciting you'd want to read ahead and go to the next booklet. You just read what you needed to read for that particular point in time. 
Did you feel yeah, comfortable that's what I was trusting we their judgment? Okay, so we had two questions. We'll go with David first. Yes, did you feel, because there's, the, the internet in itself is, you know, just a vast, I don't know, repository of information. And because it's not, you're just typing and you're typing and you're looking. What did you decide to trust? Was it the internet or the doctor? Well, I ended up going else? with, I ended up going with the doctor and the booklets. Um, just because, yeah, you don't know what the accuracy is on the, the websites. I think if someone had given me a list of links of places to go to where somebody else has identified what's safe, then I would have used it. So on my website, I've got a list of links to places that where you know that the information would be correct. Um, listed some, some forums and stuff. So, and I asked people that um, even if cancer patients or whatever who have um, specific sites where they've gone and it's provided them with great information, I sort of look at the information there and then I may add it to my list of links. Hmm. So you actually took a step forward and rewrote the book about what do you need to know about this particular form of cancer? So I, want, I wanted to address sort of the emotional element. So again, sort of what symptoms you just either don't pack or just don't bring much of it because it's going to cause you more problems than it's, than it's worth. Like the what if wow. scenarios where you're going, what if this happens? What if this happens? So you don't even want to go there. Um, I said that the ability to multitask becomes a bad thing because, you know, if you can focus on, if you do something with your hands or you're keeping active, then you can't be constantly thinking about um, other things. Um, but yeah, so I started to try to provide a list of things to bring with you, like your sense of humor or your problem solving skills, um, but maybe tone down on your research skills using the internet. So I mean, it just tries to deal with sort of the different emotional aspects of it. And uh, yeah, I've had people, and I know for different types of uh, cancer, you, you, do, you do your treatments in different orders. So somebody said, well, you've got surgery listed before chemo. And it's like, yeah, that happened to be my experience. But it's like I said, with any kind of flight, you could have, you know, multiple stops in between and depending on where you're coming from. So depending on what your diagnosis, you could end up doing things in a totally different order because that's what needs to be done. And I also make sure that people understand that the new normal, that cancer is the gift that keeps on giving. It's never truly gone. The cancer itself may be, but the repercussions of the side effects of medication that you're on, um, the constant um, sort of the fear of recurrence is always there. You just have to sort of keep it under control. Some people end up with um, post-traumatic stress disorder. So one of my blog posts was me sitting um, in a hospital. My husband was having surgery. And I was just in the waiting room and then they moved me into this other room and I started feeling like I was hyperventilating. It was like, I'm looking around like, what is my problem? And I see that I'm sitting in a room with sort of a, one of those curtains around it and I'm sitting on a green recliner. All my chemo treatments were taken on a green recliner. And I didn't know I had an issue with it until I sat there and I'm trying to slow my breathing. The tears are starting. So yes, there was a post-traumatic moment that I hadn't anticipated. No one talked to me about and said, hey, this may happen to you, and that's okay. I'm speechless. Wow. People would hope that I would be speechless at some point, so. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> So remember, buy so her book. <coughs> That's right. Uh, I got a re I get, I'm actually supposed to get a reprint done, <laughs> but right now it's only available Whoa. off my website. But I mean, I just I self-published. Um. But yeah. So and my son, the cover on the in the presentation that my son designed that cover, the person who edited 
it had a different type of um, cancer at some point in her life. And my, the person who was sort of my publisher, she had breast cancer um, twice. So it was ironic that it sort of all fit together that way, quite, quite by fluke. Okay, so Kathleen has to break off. She's got another meeting. Terry, I think you had another question. I wanted to ask, um, I, I like your idea, what you were, what um, David was talking about and the way you answered. We've been thinking in my group about, um, I don't know if anybody's looked at this thing on Salesforce called Trailhead, and it's a way of getting help that's guided. And I like what you said is that otherwise it feels like a free-for-all. Sure, there's a lot of information, but you don't know which way to go or what's trustable. And even if we don't necessarily have to recreate all the information, but if we can give people the trail, the trail, Head, start at the trailhead and decide which trail you want to take. We're, we're hoping that that will be a useful way for us to make use of what's already there, which sounds like what you did too. You helped people find the right trail. And I also wanted to ask David, I think I saw the information for the presentation you were mentioning about telling storytelling through PowerPoint, but I think I missed it and I was just wondering if you happen to know what it was, if you would put it in the chat, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Vicky, can you you do that? I think it was Rick that was giving that presentation. Uh, maybe Robert. That's it. Okay. Yes, I, and I'll include that in the email that goes out with the link to this recording and link to Debbie's website and a couple of stuff like that. Um, all of our I I did manage to get all of our webinars transferred from Adobe Connect into YouTube. So. Uh, I've actually, that's a very nice thing too, because I've been uh, looking for a new job and I discovered by accident that a, a webinar that I gave to the, to the SIG is on there and I'm using that as a, as a portfolio piece, as a sample. Yes. A, a talking piece when I go for job interviews. So that's actually on my resume. So great job, Vicki. Awesome. Great, that's going to yeah. be great to know about because sometimes I see these things and I want to attend for whatever reason I can't. So if there's a link to those, that's terrific. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And, and that's an, another incentive for everyone in the SIG. If you've got a great idea, tell Vicki and it becomes a webinar. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, because uh, uh, the SIG is only as good as the participation that's in it. Right. And I know the participation is wildly crazy. But uh, all of that kind of stuff contributes towards your skill development, and it, you, you could sell, you could put that on your performance appraisal and tell future employers, look, 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 you can actually see me on TV. And they go, awesome. <laughs> That's a great idea. Thank you. <laughs> so everybody's going to have to check out David's webinar about. I'm looking for what the exact title was. I think go? it was my mental models, designing documentation with users, with users in, mind. in mind, right? Yes. And uh, it is available through that link I just put in the chat window. So. Yes, that kind of like, ooh, my, I'm on the internet. Ooh. <laughs> All right, everybody, uh, another big round of applause. And I'm going to end the recording, but I will leave the meeting open and we can have a private unrecorded chat if anybody wants to say anything in confidence. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, especially to those attending and to our wonderful presenter, Debbie Kerr, um, super generous with both her personal and her professional sharing today. This was super great. See you next time.